basically, uh, so I want to just um, go through a bunch of different areas of the project. So the activity, where we are, how, how many are using it, and blah, blah, blah. So uh, first, of course, we're 26 years old now. I still have whiskey left from the 25 years uh, celebration last year. I'm not sure exactly how to spend it. What's 25 year old, right? It's not 26. Uh, but uh, we've grown a little bit. I think uh, maybe Stefan has helped us here. Uh, so we're at 167k lines of code, 20k more than last year at roughly this time. Um, so we didn't actually have a curl up last year um, because of reasons. So, uh, um, but I'd still try to, most of my slides here are comparing things to roughly 12 months back in time. And I actually made some of these slides over the last two weeks, so they're not maybe exactly like this, but you know, roughly. So this is the growth. Uh, as always, <coughs> funnily is linear, sort of 26 years, and it's just, or maybe it's even 28 years if we count from before Carl, but it's a, a strange linear growth. Maybe some yakety yak up here, but still. So I think it's fascinating that we can manage to have that. And it's strange too. Uh, the number of man pages over there, it's a more slightly different uh, graph. <coughs> and we're not quite up to 500, but almost. So, uh, <coughs> um, lines of documentation as well, so sort of also matches roughly the, the growth. Maybe not as linear, but still soon 100K lines. Um, this is just lines of uh, all files under the docs folder. So uh, I guess there are also some number of comments and whatever in, uh, in the documentation files. And it, here's a, one of my uh, latest fun uh, graphs, uh, lines of code <coughs> per line of docs, which I think is kind of, I mean, it's good, right, to have more docs or, or fewer lines per line of docs. So it's actually been developing pretty good. So we're stuck here somewhere in 1.7 lines of code per lines of doc. Does this include line, uh, code commentary? And on which side? Lines yeah. of code or lines of doc? So th the, <laughs> the lines <laughs> of code uh, includes comments. Yes. Okay. So the lines of code includes, but it excludes empty lines. So that's just code and comments, but okay. not empty lines. And the good docs is, is just all lines added in the docs folder. So right. it's a, a very rough, yeah, thing, yeah, right? Yeah. So you shouldn't <laughs> inspect it too closely, but it's <laughs> yeah, yeah, in the ballpark like this. I, I just, I just think it's fun because you know we saw that uh, growth, of, uh, lines of code is growing like that, so it's good that we also keep up the documentation. Yeah. So <laughs> even though it grows a lot, we also keep documenting stuff. That's it's decent. very visible that someone did the documentation boost like hell in 2014. <laughs> yes, exactly. That's quite clear, right? <coughs> because the, the source code did not drop. <laughs> yeah. And I, I think that's the result of um, the big uh, split when we split up pretty much and introduced. Uh, so uh, we have, since we had the curl is a set doc function, and the other ones, I split them up in individual man pages that year. So instead of one man page, it turned into 250. And, and but by doing that, we also added uh, you know, individual examples for each option and so on that we didn't have before. So, so that yes, the uh, amount of documentation exploded yep. that year. Uh, we're still at 28 transfer protocols. And, and tra protocols here is a, a URL schemes. Really. And we haven't <coughs> added any new in a while. We added uh, WebSockets uh, in 22. I know it's weird to show this in a linear graph like this, but you know, once you learn a new plot and how to do graphs, everything turns out to be good <laughs> graphs. <laughs> <laughs> you have to stick to what you know. Uh, I like to display the, the map of uh, protocols with this sort of <laughs> the underlying TCP, UDP file system, and we have SSH, TLS, Quick, roughly like this. Uh, quite a few of them. Of course, um, many of them not very well used. Some of them not even very well tested in the test suite. 
we support 36 different third-party dependencies, which is uh, sort of the development of different third-party dependencies, uh, so third-party dependencies that we so have supported over time has been this. So we actually removed G uh, NSS and GSKit uh, last year, right? So they then we went down to 36 because we were up. <coughs> and operating systems, I do this uh, uh, very, uh, not very scientific question every now and then if someone can figure out an operating system not included on this that they've actually used Perl on. So sometimes I do that <coughs> exercise and people tend to find a new one. And then we have this uh, philosophical exercise, what is an operating system and what is a distro? And then, let's not go there. <laughs> it's also, you know, it's it's not a clear cut. It's a gray scale. What's what's what Alpine? Right? So because then people always try to find some of these that they think is not actually two different ones or a missed one that could actually possibly be. But I don't think it matters. I think uh, uh, there's a lot of operating systems that have run curl and. Uh, then people also ask me, how do I test on all of these? Uh, sure, we don't, right? We test on maybe eight of these. And most of these also, we never got feedback from the ones who actually ported to these or ran on these, so we don't actually know what kind of extra patches or things people used to run on them. So maybe they patched them a lot, maybe they didn't. Some of them, of course, brought back patches. Do you want to add another one, Vision also? Yes, Vision. <laughs> right, that's true. Uh, and that's a that's I think I have more of the uh, the Apple ones yeah, uh, separate yeah. uh, separate OSs and people tend to tell me that no they're not separate they're really okay maybe I don't know <laughs> well, technically yeah there's ex exactly <laughs> or are they different distros made of the same I don't know mm. I've actually tried to so uh, as you can see I don't s for example I try to avoid s specifying different Linux distros yeah. because they're certainly the same OS, sort of. But are they really? I but you do have different oh. BSD distros. I have, I'm noticing exactly that. I have different BSD distros, but then, you know, I have these arguments that sometimes I say, but are they really different? And then someone said, yeah, they are. And, <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I, I, I sort of, yeah, I, I can't spend the notion of time to just <laughs> yeah, investigate yeah, yeah. the difference. I, mm, so I, I make a judgment call. If someone actually insists on them being different enough, then I put them as different. I don't know. I, I, I kind of like the list of operating systems because it's certainly more operating systems than any mere mortal can list by themselves, right? And <coughs> I certainly have never used this many or, or knew they existed in, in many cases. Um, and, and similarly, I also ask people what kind of CPU architecture they've run curl on. And similarly, what is a CPU architecture? And then we have the same debate. Uh, it's not really different CPU architectures, or they are different or not. So, um, but there are 28 of them, and really, curl has run on virtually everything that is 32-bit or, or larger, and uh, there's really no reason why they couldn't run on, because, I mean, people do see compilers and POSIX operating systems on everything, so it <laughs> should be possible to run curl on. Is there anyone actually running a VAX still? <laughs> uh, yes. Okay. <laughs> yes, they are. Uh, actually, to them. <laughs> actually, they open VMS no, uh, the guys. They tend to be really fast with new ports. Of curl, I mean, building curl too. So, right. and they they build it for Max x86 and some others. So okay. I don't. Well, yeah, technically I'll, I'll I don't know. Uh, well. Technically I don't know if they actually use it, but I know that people actually see. Okay. Cool. Uh, Reason, uh, reason have built yeah. curl. I suppose that's the reason why I alpha and titanium are there. And, uh, and really, they're also a sort of, they have run on these. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, some of them yep. probably stopped. I was just surprised to still see Vax somewhere. Might yes. always be some hobbyists somewhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I guess <laughs> sort of, yeah, VM, uh, Vax or Alpha, I guess, not too common these days. But, but yeah. Well, even M68 hobbyists, day, I guess Vax is dying for the moment. Yes, I guess it's also a rare hobbyist yeah. thing to have in your base. Very. Yeah. <laughs> but still, a kind of a fun list. <laughs> uh, along, um, again, also a number of really, really weird or, or CPU architectures. Um, one of my favorites is this Sea Sky. I don't even remember what it is, but someone <laughs> showed me a description. I've never heard of it. <laughs> uh, 
I'm sure we can Google it, but I uh, I don't remember even anymore. Uh. And of course, my my uh, favorite slide is the. <laughs> we're, we're also <laughs> Do we know the architecture? Um, <laughs> we actually don't know anything at all. Uh, we uh, so they don't tell. So we just know that Curl was involved in the helicopter mission project. Didn't you get some badge from GitHub or something? Yeah, yes. Yeah, we all. I mean, all contributors to curl at that. Well, actually, they messed up. So I think we have over you have gotten that badge. So because you know, the GitHub worked with NASA, and they NASA told them a bunch of open source projects that they used, uh, and they won't tell us exactly what for. Just it was involved. So it might not actually be on Mars. Maybe it was just involved somewhere. But it's funnier to say Mars. But but uh, so then. GitHub gave everyone a badge who had contributed to curl at some point in time, which was a really, really long time ago, like 2012 or something. Um, so it was just a few hundred. And then I think I discussed that with the GitHub people that sort of you took that date very weirdly. So sort of what, what made you decide that NASA used the curl version from 2012? It seemed like sort of arbitrary. Did NASA actually say this? They of course hadn't, so GitHub then updated that so to the current date instead, which <laughs> was years after this. Or so, so that <coughs> and they took all names from 2022 or something. So suddenly, <laughs> thousands of people got that badge. But that was probably not correct either. But then I just shut up. So, <laughs> so uh, for sure, a lot of people have that Mars badge on GitHub now that contributed to Curl even after <laughs> they landed on Mars. But if we had telemetry, we'd know, wouldn't we? <laughs> Right. Uh, yeah, <laughs> if we knew exactly which version they used, yeah. And uh, as I mentioned, we uh, we removed two support for two TLS backends over the last year, so we're down to twelve. And it, it is twelve because we count all, not maybe not all, but several different uh, open SSL forks, like the the most recent one, AWS LC, as a separate one, and I counted basically as a separate one because we had some kind of logic that separates it mostly if def they use this name but <laughs> at least there is sort of awareness in the code uh, and uh, I'm going to uh, discuss um, in my in a later talk about the future about potentially uh, reducing the number of TLS backends more but more about that then so we're up at 259 command line options um, and then we can discuss if it's good to have a lot of command line options or not. Uh, of course, I don't think anyone actually thinks that is a good thing. But when we add stuff, what do we do? We add <laughs> command line options. So the, uh, the growth looks like that. Similar to lines of code, uh, very linear over time. Uh, back when we released curl the first time, there were 24 options. So 24 options in 1998, 259 now. That's 10 per year, give or take. So nine the last year. Yeah, it seems to match. Yeah. Do we ever deprecate any of them? Uh, no, <laughs> since we don't <laughs> want to break users. <laughs> That's a sort of a truth, sort of that try to, I, I, I like to say that we don't break stuff for users, but if there aren't any users, <laughs> then yeah. we don't break, right? So, so in, in reality we have, a few options that don't work anymore because we have options that uh, ask for SSL v2, for example. And mm -hmm. there, there aren't any TLS of, uh, libraries anymore that mm -hmm. actually support it. So if you ask for it, it won't work. And so yes, there is kind of deprecation, even though it's the options are still there. Accidental deprecation, <laughs> let's call it that. That's a good, uh, good <laughs> accidental, or sort of uh, casual, try gently, uh, <laughs> under the radar deprecation. <laughs> You remove some backends already, so some options may be related to those backends. Well, the the uh, yeah, the, the idea is that the, the TLS backends are supposed to be, I mean, not matter, right? So they're supposed to work the same way. So the options should work the same independent of backend. It's not entirely true, but that's sort of what we try to aspire. So those those backends that we removed, I don't think any one of those supported any feature uniquely. So we didn't actually support uh, or drop support for any specific features when we drop support for those TLS libraries. 
it could potentially end up in that situation, right? If we support a particular TLS feature for just a single TLS backend and we will remove that backend, then yeah, we would remove that uh, feature. But we basically only remove TLS backends too when in reality no one is actually using them or working on that. So then again, we go back to do we actually hurt anyone if no one is using those features that we remove? And I, and I think that is, okay, it's hard to know if anyone is actually using those features, but I think that's, I think that's the only uh, sort of the real pragmatic way to look at it, because why would you s keep on doing things if nobody's using them? Um, so then we, um, we added nine command line options, but only three curl EC setup options. So not every, w basically meaning that we did more uh, com uh, curl command line tool stuff that wasn't completely run to library options, <coughs> but where where uh, yeah the growth of those options are similar. Um, right, there were just a little over fifty when we started in in two thousand when when lib curl was created. So fifty <coughs> tools tool in just in twenty four years. That's roughly 10 years. Ten years. <coughs> we added three API calls, so we're at 94, which then, of course, is, that's just the function calls. So we have so many separate options to a few of them, so I don't know if it matters, but 94 op uh, API calls. It looks like that. It was flat for a long time there, for many years, and now it's starting to grow. And when it comes to testing, uh, of course, we're still uh, running everything in C, despite everyone thinking uh, and talking about. It. But of course, we, we keep to C because it's uh, um, efficient. It's there. It's portable. It runs everywhere. And I, I often tend to say that, I mean, the reason we have 101 operating systems and 21, 28 CPU architectures is because we write it in C. And also, we have everything in C already. C was always the only answer to how you could do this up to possibly you could discuss now if you could use another language but uh, I'm not going to rewrite curl in any other language. I will talk more about sort of rusty stuff also in a separate session. Um, and of course we, we do our best to mitigate the possible problems or challenges or, or stuff with C just doing things uh, the way we're supposed to do review, test, fuss, analyze, <coughs> bike bounty perhaps also. Uh, yeah, but I'll, I'll mention that I have a security session too as well. Uh, so when it was just fuzz, of course, been fuzzing curl since, uh, I want to say 2018, 19, something, maybe five, six years or so. Uh, they suddenly barely find anything these days. It still happens. Every once in a while, they find something slightly off, and we fix it immediately. And what what's good is that they, since they test our mas master, we basically never release anything that OSS Fuzz finds problematic. And they haven't found anything in the release code for years, and they keep on hammering. I think nowadays it's quite clear that the fuzzing we do is sort of, yeah, we've, we've sort of exhausted that fuzzing. We need better fuzzing, more fuzzing, more entry points, or possibly more intelligent fuzzing somehow that reaches further because it seems like we've sort of hit the wall when it comes to fuzzing, the, the way we do OSS fuzz right now. Uh, test cases done, so we increased the number of test cases, and then the number of test cases is really weird thing to count, but it's just a test case. The test case can do basically a tiny little thing or a lot of things. This is just a count of test cases. It doesn't really say how much we test stuff, but it's the <laughs> really the only way we can I can count easily how, how we're changing stuff. So we, yeah, we grew by 10% with test cases. I think uh, a lot thanks to Stefan's new uh, test suite and uh, his number of new tests in there with the PyTest stuff. Uh, which also added uh, or increased coverage. We don't actually measure test coverage anymore, but people can just know that we have increased test coverage as well. <coughs> so I, uh, 
I just try to then plot. Uh, that's the, the green one here is uh, the source code growth that I showed before, and the blue one is the number of test cases. So it just shows that the number of test cases actually grows slightly faster than the number of lines of code, which I think is good. Or we can also see sort of lines of code per test case. That it Let's just say I, I added a test case for every bug that I wrote. Mm -hmm. and then so luckily, you wrote a <laughs> lot of bugs. Yes, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and I think you were not alone. <laughs> so, but yes, so lines of code per test case, so that's shrinking and been shrinking for a while, even though it hasn't shrunk very fast recently. But it's still, I think, in, in the right direction. So we're below, below 100 lines of code per test case, which I think is cool. And uh, of course, we should continue having that development. I think it just proves that we're at least not going crazy in, in the wrong direction. So I counted, and I counted 10,000 bug fixes uh, <coughs> total, 10,050 ones, since, uh, since the beginning of time. And we, <laughs> we noted that 1,184 bug fixes just the last year. That's kind of an interesting count. So I don't think you did them all. <laughs> Maybe a few. Maybe a I few, did a few. A few. Right. I did eighty-four of them. Uh, so. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Do we know how many uh, uh, bug fixes come from Hacker One that aren't security problems? Do you have a sense of? Yes, I I know exactly how many. The Hacker One. Uh, well, I, I have the number. Uh, I've talked about that separately. But uh, on Hacker One, uh, over the since we started on Hacker One, which is exactly f five years ago now, basically. Uh, we had had 450 something reports, right. and uh, I think 60-ish of them turned out to be, I think 69 maybe, were mm -hmm. actually CVEs in the end, and something like 90 of them were just plain bugs. So that's, that's roughly the rate. I think it's kind of decent. I mean, I, and the rest of them were, of course, then just stuff. Everything from crazy stuff to just crazy stuff. Yeah, it bugs. Hmm. Yeah, that's uh, one of the end, uh, edges there. Uh, <coughs> and uh, then uh, the bug fix rate, uh, the, 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 um, the pink plot here is the bug fixes per day rate, which uh, then as you can see from 2014 something that has slowly increased and nowadays we're actually landing on average, something between three and a half and four bug fixes per day, which I think is also. How, how is that possible? How is that possible? CI jobs. How is that possible? Yeah. And not uh, exactly for testing everything and for. Well, of course, um, the, some explanation could be that we're sometimes over marking them as bug fixes because maybe, uh, maybe they just fixed a bug that we introduced the other day, right? Maybe that shouldn't be counted as a bug fix, it's just a follow-up. Oh, I'm community. thinking on the other side. Can we run 400 CI jobs and with our resource quota? We can, yeah, yeah, they're just slow. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I, I'll get to the CI part because we have 136 CI jobs right now. Oh, right. Um, also 15 more than last year. Uh, so yeah, it keeps growing there as well. And then, so the number of CI jobs we've had is, so it has, uh, the, the, the explosion has at least sort of slowed a little bit. So maybe maybe we won't have 10,000 in a few years. Maybe it'll just be 200 in a few years. <coughs> and of course the challenge is how do we do, how do, we do this and, and keep, keep them stable, keep them solid and everything. And um, everything pretty much runs on Linux. We have Windows and we have Mac as well. <coughs> um, FreeBSD, we have one. <laughs> we had a few more over the years, but the only the only free service that offers FreeBSD now has a very strict, uh, uh, well, ratio. We can't run very much on it. Are these jobs uh, self-hosted? No. Is it all GitHub Actions? No. Oh. I'll show you there. There are several ones. These ones. This is GitHub Actions. So most of them are certainly GitHub Actions. Yeah. And then there are App Bayer and there are uh, Azure, Cirrus CI and Circle CI. 
that they have the ones that are still. Zoom? I've never heard of Zoom. Z okay. Yeah, but we're not using that anymore. It died <laughs> okay. over here. Oh. Many died. So you can see the Travis one died over there, the Zoom one died over there. Right. So basically, we did a lot of Travis CI back in, and, and that died in 2021 when they sort of changed their yeah. pricing model. So we everyone ditched left. that, everyone <laughs> left, and we switched. And, <laughs> and then uh, the, the ones who were running Zoom uh, sort of volunteered. So they took over a lot of them. But it turned out that Zoom was not a very stable solution for uh -huh. us. So that's why it sort of decreased over here until we just killed it off. And in the meantime, GitHub Actions sort of just exploded as well. Or po also partly, partly because it's easy to do it on GitHub and partly because GitHub has cranked up the our parallelism. So we're not at the sort of mere bottom three tier. We're at mm. some kind of slightly elevated tier. So we don't suffer so much from problems with parallel runs. So I, I'm not sure exactly what the threshold is or where, where the ceiling is, but it seems to be pretty fine. I mean, the GitHub jobs are not the problematic ones for us at least. Question: If if anyone like say a cloud provider or any other service provider, can they help you with some sort of like if you need some specific VMs or things where you want to run, like which will keep running and we provide help you with? Well, the, the biggest problem we have with CIs is just the their the limitations in the, in the parallelism they offer us. So basically, um, well, maybe that's not it entirely true. Maybe we should we we. Like self-hosted runners. And right. Runners, like yeah, exactly. So possibly what we lack the most is some some of the services just limit us in parallelism too much so that the CI tests take too, take a long time because they have to wait until other jobs complete first. So so sometimes CI, the, it could take like four, six hours for them to complete. And that is one problem. And another problem is that we have a limited set of operating systems to choose from. So that, that's why we basically only run on, on a Linux, Windows, FreeBSD, and Mac. Yeah. There, there's, we also have Spark um, self-hosted things, but it's so unstable. That's why I don't even include it there. So it's, it, it runs every now and then. Uh, so yeah, that, that if anyone would, that would be helpful for the project would be to have more runners on, on other operating systems and just having more parallelism on the ones that we already have. Like the Windows ones we have there, they're often limited. So we often, often when you created PR in curl, you can see all jobs are done except the 25 remaining ones, yeah, and the 25 right. remaining ones are all on Windows. And and we all know that getting stuff to run on Windows is typically the most complicated platform. So basically, yeah, yeah, everything r runs fine. Now you just have to wait for the final 25 jobs to yeah. show you the real problems. Yeah. So we just have to sit and wait uh, another hour or two. Well, we don't. Um, the, um, my share of commits, uh, the total commit count, is the green one. So it's, uh, it's still shrinking at least. What's what's wrong? <laughs> you, <laughs> Stefan, uh, challenging me by doing a lot of commits. No, I think it's good. I mean, I don't I don't have to do commits. I think it's good that we're many people committing, and uh, <coughs> the number of commits per month. Uh, has uh, the, the uh, 12 months average is the pink one, so you can see that the 12 months average has a bit been over the all time average for several years, so it's gradually increasing for, for the last years at least. Um, and the number of commits per year, of course, it, uh, the last year, 20, yeah, 2023 year was uh, the second most active year ever, and then I mean, they, they've the most active one over there in the beginning that was not even using Git, right? That was CVS early days, no CI jobs. So a completely different reality. And a lot of, you know, follow up oops commits when you wrote stuff in the previous commit because there were no CIs. So how do you know things work? There's some sort of long term periodic cycle going on here? Maybe. I, I actually don't think so, but it might look like that. Do we have reviews uh, for like? Uh, can't we tell? Because reviews is a, a lot of time to do. You know, looking at a PR and, and 
approving it or not. Do you have a draft for that? No. Um, I don't. I don't know what. What, you, what do you mean? What, what should it show? How many reviews we do, or how many? Yeah, how many reviews of, uh, we do, and how many reviews a person does. Right, but we're very sloppy in keeping track of that properly. Right. So I don't think we would have no, uh, no very good data on that. We've never, would never, been good at. Is that sort of a limiting off. factor in terms of forward velocity? Yeah. Uh, there could be a lot of things open for review, but it just takes time to get. You're right. Yeah, yeah. You're basically queuing time. How long? How long does a PR have to wait before it merges? But th on, on the other hand, it, there could be a lot of reasons why something takes a long time. People mentioned that to me when, when I merged the ECH patch the other day. Someone mm. looked at it and said, wow, they've been working on that PR for six months. And sure, they did, but that was only six months as a PR, right? They, mm. they worked on it a long time before it ma even became a PR. Uh, so it's, it's difficult stuff to sometimes to show just as a graph. It's an art to know when a PR should be raised. Or do yes. you know, do you want to, um, do you want to uh, legislate the PR conversation before it's really fully baked? Yeah. yeah, you certainly have work in progress PRs also. Right, right, right. Yeah. Yeah. Because sometimes you just want to see how is CI handling the current state. Mm -hmm. So you make it a PR to see how, how the but CI you, you runs. You just get that on the branch, don't you? Don't you get, don't we get CI jobs if you push a branch to, to GitHub? If you have enabled for your personal repo, yeah. Yeah, mm. yeah you can do that in your personal. But you can do a draft PR yeah. and get the same effect, yeah. but on the projects. Yeah. And usually when you, exactly, and usually you wanna, when you do that, you, you want to also open the discussion, right? Yeah. Is this the right way to do it? Is this interesting? Make it mm. visible. Make it visible, exactly. I, 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 this is stuff that I'm thinking we should maybe do. And sometimes people shoot it down immediately. No, stupid, uh, close it and move on. And sometimes it's, Meh, yeah, maybe we should do it that way. Maybe not, we could tweak it, can work on it. So write commit authors per year. S a tiny, tiny uh, amount more last year. So that was the record so far. So uh, a lot of these graphs actually sh seems to indicate that the activity and, and, and number of contributors, uh, et cetera, are growing, uh, or at least not shrinking. Uh, number of people that did 10 commits or more in a calendar year. It's a little bit of arbitrary how to, to what it means. It just means that uh, we're at least a bunch of people that are doing more than just single commits. Uh, I also try to sort of this, how many committers uh, does it take to reach uh, X amount of percent of the commits in a single year? And you know, the first few years over there, I did 70% of all the commits myself. And ever since then, we've been, it, it requires more people than just me to reach 70% and even reaching 60%. Even though I, I reached 60% in 2020. <laughs> I don't know how. And of course, uh, I should say that, I mean, I'm the only one who gets paid full time to work at Curl, so I'm completely aware that I have the best ability of chance to do a lot of commits in Curl that few others can compete with the same way. <coughs> and counting just people who have contributed to Curl, uh, we increased that number by 10% again. I think it's kind of, uh, just the percentage is fun just because we're 26 years old, right? So we should split it up if we would just add another year it would be much less and uh, much fewer than 10 percent so a lot of contributors and contributors are of course anyone we give credit to in commits which typically are people <coughs> writing code uh, reporting bugs or helping out in other ways what happened then it was just me catching up so i just went back and added all the names that should have been in there from the beginning so it's actually a little bit of a lie it should have been pretty much straight but that was me just taking the decision that we should keep all the names that ever helped out in the thanks list. So just th from then, that point on, we've been much more strict at sort of keeping, adding names to the list when, whenever there's someone helping out. But 
the script is just picking the number of names in the list uh, per release tag, I think. So that's why it shows the bump. <coughs> 1,263 commit authors, also 129 more than last year. <coughs> and uh, if you want to see who actually is um, doing all the commits, so these are the top 20 commit authors uh, the last the last year. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, Richard is there. I think a lot of people in this room are here. Uh, so, so I'm there, Stefan is there, Victor is there, and Dan. So the top four uh, are at least in this room. Um, <coughs> oh, Christian's there yeah. as well. Uh, so yeah, but of course these are these are people <laughs> depend on this. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if it's good or bad, but <laughs> no, <laughs> the goal should be next year to get into that list. That's a good uh, ambition. The Thunderbolt is the curl AI, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it has to be the curl AI. And, and Daniel, you're sort of just making it. Just stuck in there. <laughs> <laughs> but that's awesome. Um, yeah. And of course, um, uh, out of the all-time people on the on the top 20 authors list, so at least 13 of them are still here within the last year or so, which I think is fine. Some of the ones that are actually on the top uh, five are absent since years, and uh, 17 did it last two years. So a lot of people are still around at least. We seem to be. Um, we're not losing many poor people, at, at least uh, not at any uh, significant rate. So m who's committing stuff then? So committing stuff separate from authoring stuff, right? So it's a shorter list. These are all the people that ever committed uh, in the last 12 months. So this is not a top list, this is the entire list. So basically, I do a lot of commits, <coughs> Victor, does a lot of commits, and then hangs down also, and then we're sort of shrinking down. So basically, me, Victor, Dan, and Jay. So, so these are the people who had permission mm -hmm. to push to the official repo. Is that right? Yes, okay. but there are many more that have permission, and I'll show you that in a second. I, I just oh, sorry, there were some a few more. Even Stefan was there. Two commits, um, and then uh, if we look at authoring commits, um, these are people that have the number of people who have committed, written a commit in the repo in the source code repo curve, curve. and that's so there's 1250 something and these are the ones who uh, ever only did it once ever so basically you can see 60 something percent of all committers only ever contributed once which I think is ah. interesting what? curious I don't know um, I I tend to uh, say that um, every contribution is a good contribution, even if they never come back, right? So it's it's not really bad that someone is there just a single commit. It's just unfortunate that they haven't come back and done another <laughs> fix. I can see you are looking at me, but yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I don't need to name names here. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> uh, so and the number of authors per month. Uh, uh, has certainly no, I don't think so. been sort of pretty intense recently. So we're at 25 authors, unique authors per month on average. Uh, first time commit authors also been kind of fun. So we have pretty much 10 new authors every month on average. Is that a COVID spike? Uh, 2021? Maybe. It's really hard to you know, wh why does something happen. And sometimes it's also a matter of who's merging the code at what point, right? So yeah. it might differ on, on month just because uh, I had a, a sort of a frenzy period and merged a lot of PRs that particular month, but I didn't do it the months before. And then people get, so getting things per month is a little bit of an arbitrary, right? So I'm not sure. Yeah. Considering other graphs I've seen that's related to COVID, I would say that that spike isn't significant enough to be an indicator. Mm. 
No, I, I think it's more. I think it's more coincidence. Yeah, more more yeah. random. Yeah. Just yeah. Uh, maybe a few more, and maybe a few more merges, and then it just bumps a few notches up. Uh, uh, maybe we had a, a few releases or two. You know, we had a right. It exactly, it could also be related to yeah. <laughs> particular <laughs> releases or particular yeah. bad regressions or or yeah. funky bugs that we did exactly that period. So. We probably would need to <coughs> check other details to know for sure more. So, if we double the number of lines, of, uh, number of commits, and we double the number of uh, people who have done the commits, then the line would look like this. So, we're one person who did 18,000 commits, we're two who did. I think it's just interesting that it becomes a linear graph when we do a logarithmic scales on both axes. Mm. I don't think it actually says anything. It's more, yeah, that's what it is. And uh, here's one of my um, scripts that I worked with the other day. Uh, I'm not sure why, but well, I'm just curious how many people actually have code uh, attributed to them uh, in the source, of, well, in production code. So basically doing a git blame on everything it, that is production code. How many names are there about <laughs> I, I was actually more interested in how many people have provided code and then we sort of overwrote their code later because we improved it, changed it, polished it, or otherwise. It turned out to be really hard to figure out how many, <laughs> how many <laughs> we, uh, we replaced, but I figured that this is um, the number of people that have code ad attributed to them when doing git blame on different uh, times, uh, different moments in time. And it, I started on 2010 now because in 2010 we switched to Git. So before Git, we didn't really have proper right separation between committer and author. So basically, so nowadays we have 630 something uh, people who have persons who have uh, their name attributed to a source code line. If you do Git blame dash CCC, it's a super slow operation to do Git blame CCC. So. It, um, I don't rerun this script very often. It took me, uh, I think it took uh, over three hours on my fairly decent machine. Uh, right, and uh, the, and these are the ones with just this, um, any number of lines, and then there's a bit, people have 10 lines, 100 lines, 1,000 lines, and 10,000 lines. And if we zoom in on the two bottom ones, it's a very, I guess you probably don't even s barely see it. I should use a different color. Uh, that's the number of people in the code that have actually written 1,000 lines or more. And that's the number of people who have written 10,000 lines of code or more. That is still present at that point in time. So we're three people in, in now that have written more than 10,000 lines of code. May I give you a tip for the future? That yes. upper line was almost invisible to me. You th you think I should use a darker color? Yeah, uh, slightly darker. Yeah. <laughs> slightly. Yeah, I know. But but uh, as I said, also ah uh, yeah, <laughs> I should. I should. Next year it'll be much better. Good. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, that's the top list of of the top twenty authors that have code remaining. Attributed to them, and again, this is sort of this is really a snapshot in time because uh, uh, I did this a few days ago. I'm not sure that some of these have been replaced since then, right? Because whenever we change things, there's a big risk that many of these would change quite a lot if we polish people's code, which we do over and over. So it's, it's not a, it's just a natural thing, right? So it's mostly just ah, oh, this is how it looked like at this particular time, uh, uh, moment in time, a few days I'm ago. Still alive. I think it's interesting <laughs> to see that Yang Tse, who, is, uh, who left the project, I think, roughly 10 years ago, still has 10,000 lines of code attributed. Was he on a particular protocol or something, which we didn't touch? No, he was more of a cleanup guy all over okay. guy. So I think maybe, if I'm guessing, a lot of source code headers, maybe, ah. or stuff like that, that I basically never changed. Okay, you met them before, correct? You made them in physical. You, you in mean person. all of these? No, no, the third who left. I've not met him. 
Oh, okay. I, I know that that's not his real name. So, th so yeah, he d he's been, he's, that's a phony name. He, uh, but I, kn I, I know he has a real name as well. But he used this name all over uh, for as long as he contributed to the curl. But I don't, he, his, uh, G uh, what's his name? Just that. Tom. <laughs> <laughs> he's our anonymous guy. I'm not, uh, well, I met, uh, I've not met Patrick in, in real life either. I've not met Jay. I've not met, so there's, bunch of these <coughs> that I've never met in person. Hopefully that one was okay. I haven't done anything bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but do, do they all sign their today? <laughs> well, um, <laughs> since I commit, you, so I commit most of them, and I ah. sign my commits. Oh right, so, so, yeah. so we have something like 70 percentage something signed commits. Whatever that means, right? What's the sign commit if we don't even know who it is anyway? So, sure, someone on the other end says it's them. <laughs> Does it matter? <laughs> um, yeah, <laughs> XZ and stuff. So, so, yeah, 628 individual authors, 89 single line. Fun. So, maintainers, we talked about who's, who has the uh, sort of right to do anything in the in the uh, yeah. these are the 18 people who are uh, in the curl uh, or uh, org at github so every, all of these people actually have the right to push code to the repository and uh, as i showed you before the, the number of people who actually committed were far from this many so most most of these people never actually exercised uh, they're right, or, or the, what they can do, which I think is fine. A bunch of them are maybe not so active anymore either, which is a different topic. Uh, so maybe we should consider. Uh, I've, I've uh, for a long time been I've been actually been poking the GitHub people about that because I wanted I wanted a way to see when people are actually active in the project in. In an, in a way, and that's I don't think it's possible using GitHub. You can you, you can see when people have been active on GitHub, but that's not what I want, right? That's I think it's basically if you're logged into GitHub or whatever. So it's I don't care about that. I want to know when someone actually come, were active in this particular project the last time, just to get a hint, right? If people are actually maybe we could move them to an to an inactive group, and that's. What, that's sort of what I want to do. So at least some of these people that maybe <laughs> have worked in curl for X number of years, maybe we should just move them out because it just feels better, more secure, and I'm sure no. If if you're not around anymore, and you're not active. I don't. I don't think anyone would care if we move them to another group without rights, because we could always move them back if if they feel they need the right. <coughs> but what is idle and, and what to do? So I haven't really <coughs> done much of this. We have I have removed people from that list before, but I have there's no I don't have any process or any, not any guides or rules on how to do that. I figured maybe we should I should just make something up and we can talk about it and then just go with that at some point. Do you? Uh, do you know if MFA is enforced for people who have committed access? It is. Um, so everything, uh, all of these 18 have okay. MFA enabled. Yeah, because I think we have that um, for the org, so you have to have that enabled yeah. to be part of. Yeah. Ah, so you enabled on the org level. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes, because I know that w uh, one person who's not on the list anymore, he didn't want it, so he sort of lost his access oh, because see. of that. Yeah. And do you always have the uh, E as well? That's in, that no, I don't, that's nothing I can enforce and nothing. I didn't know if, uh, was it GitHub who gave it to us or Microsoft? No, it is Google. Sure. Google. You got them for free, is that? No, they gave them to us, didn't they? Yes. Yeah, they did. There was yeah, a there was foundation a someone could do it. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, exactly. It was, it wasn't it OpenSSF? Yeah. Oh, it was OpenSSF. Yeah. Could be. 
Ibuko is here, correct, sir. And they are generally willing to help in possible these kind of things all the time. Right, but I, I think, I, th I think mandating MFA is a good step, yeah. than rather than I exact MFA. Yeah, I found out that um, GitHub is starting to do that by themselves as well. Yes. Yeah. Like so, my my, I I got an email that I'm I'm gonna be required. I already have it, but I got an email because I committed in some repo. They don't say which. And now I'm I have I'm requ I am required to have it enabled. Okay. I yeah. guess you're doing that for everyone. So I assume Co is such a big project that anybody who commit to Co uh, needs to have it enabled, regardless of how org the org is set up. Right. Right. Um, I think I think I enable that then that enforcement when I since I uh, several years ago right I went through that uh, best practices uh, thing that. OpenSSF now hosts the OpenSSF uh, open source best practices thing. And to reach the goal level there, I had to make sure that everyone was mandated MFA. So I made sure because I wanted to reach that goal level. Yeah, I remember <coughs> I had to enable that MFA in GitHub when I signed up to some Mozilla organization a couple of years ago. Uh, right. And we haven't added any new people to this or org in a while. Um, just wanted to. Like that. I'm not sure exactly either exactly when we would or what kind of requirements we have. Uh, I'm not sure we need any formalized ones either. It's more like is if someone shows up, is eager, interested, and would benefit from it, uh, or if we would benefit from adding more people, then we can do it. Uh, it's not really necessary, I think. Yes, uh, as I think we manage pretty well as we do with the set of people we have right now. So maybe there's also. We, we don't have any sort of strict requirements or responsibilities for the people involved <coughs> either. So right now it's just, it's easy for them to be there on the list because they don't have to do anything. And um, like you, you could possibly see, for example, that my brother is on that list, to be honest. Yeah. <coughs> and I don't think he has ever committed to the project. <laughs> but um, I also have him as a sort of a backup me at some point uh, because he's around and he is, I trust him. and. So that's also why it's sort of convenient, also just as uh, safety precautions for whatever. In my neck of the woods, so and sometimes people then ask about the bus factor in curl, and I, even though I I do more uh, as a sort of accumulated, I've done more than fifty percent of all commits, but I don't I don't ever think that we actually have a bus factor of one in the project. Bus factor people tend to calculate that based on. We have different tools, and different tools come up with different factors, and I don't think it matters. But I, I think we're actually in a position where we are more than just me who can do m most or everything in the project. So have you sort of tested that theory by going on holiday for a month and not responding to anything and see what but happens? Uh, <laughs> I no, I not 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 sort of. I'm not tested it to that extent because oh. I figured that just I don't. I think we need to test it. Out. Just add payments to, to everyone. Why, why switch everything around like that? But I think if if it actually needs to be done, we can do it. So I've, I've tested it in like I can be absent from the project for weeks without it sort of hurting the project. But I have, we have not tested it so in, in the way that I still have done all the releases, for example. And mm -hmm. I still, because I, for example, I have. Um, Login access is to machines that are not distributed among the team. So that would be a. So if anyone else would have would upload, for example, a release to the release server, that's using stuff that is not widely known. And I don't think we need to do that uh, unless we need to do it. So I don't I don't practice that. But I have people that if I'm actually get run over by a bus, someone has the code. Someone can fix it. Uh, it's on the topic of, of contributors, H have you considered or do you know if anybody from the project okay. has considered yeah. signing yeah. Up for Google Summer of Code or similar projects? Yeah, actually, uh, well, Google Summer of Code is really hard to get into. I, I actually tried like 10 years ago. <laughs> and um, uh, I think it's only turned out harder to become accepted as a project. Tool. 
to those to those sites. Google Summer Code, you pretty much have to be a really big organization. And you have to have a lot of good proposals for projects to do. So what every tiny project does to get in there is to be part of a bigger project. Like every GNU project is part of GNU. GNU is there. So you WGET can get Summer Code contributors because they're part of GNU. But we're not part of GNU. We can so it's hard for us to be part of stuff like that because it's designed for bigger orgs. It's hard to do you think there's any uh, possibility of applying through some distro? So for example, Debian. Uh, the, the, the main question, I guess, is do you know if there's anybody who would be willing to be the mentor of the project? I'm, sh I'm sure. I'm sure we could arrange for that. I don't think that would be the problem. I mean, uh, uh, so no, I, I think that could work. I think the, the problem is that we would, we could possibly do it under someone else, like a distro or something, yes. If it would be, it could be done. Cool. Um, so we, over the, over the last few years maybe, I, I, so I like this graph just because it shows, this is just, again, I, I can do stuff with GNU plot and then everything becomes plots. So, <laughs> so this is sort of just the, the number of days between releases, and why I think why I still think it makes sense to see it as a plot is because every dip here is sort of a sign of defeat, or because it means that we've released something uh, very quickly uh, after a, a previous release. So, basically, when we're below here somewhere, we know it's a follow-up release, so it's a patch release. And if we look here, the last few years we've done bunch of them which uh, I don't know it's kind of a, a sign of a either a, a, a that we have regressions that are bad enough that we have to do follow-up release and it's also a sign that we can actually uh, address regressions and do a quick follow-up release and fix problems I think we've um, they became a little bit more frequent here recently when we have started to try to take care of regressions a little bit more uh, more often or more frequently than we did before. We still have a lot of regressions, but yeah. So anyway, that's just most <coughs> uh, sort of it. It just shows the reality. So the twelve-month average uh, release cycle has shrunk a lot uh, recently because we've done these huge number of patch releases. Do you think this indicates uh, that maybe the release cycle duration? can change? Maybe. Okay. Yeah, it could be. I'm not sure. Um, yeah, yeah, maybe, but uh, w would it solve this if we change the release cycle length? Or I, I'm, I don't know if it's solving it, but uh, like... Because my... my you know, release more often is, is better, right? <laughs> or is it? Mm. Yeah, but... but so li like this, so when we release something and there's a regression that is important enough to do a follow-up release, does it matter if the release cycle is four weeks, six weeks, or 12 weeks, or yeah, eight yeah. weeks? Because then we do a follow-up release anyway, really soon. So it's I, th I think the, the, the big question, or the big relevance for the release cycle length or period is that we don't get proper testing by humans, right, until we actually do a release. So mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. why we need to have them fairly frequent anyway, because otherwise it'll just take longer until people yeah. find that problem. Which people, is the people only test releases. Right, so well, it doesn't really matter whatever we do, yeah. to people won't test stuff for real until we release. Yeah. We can just hope for that, but it never happens. Yeah. So I don't know. I'm open for tweaking things, but I'm not. I'm not sure changing the release cycle length will matter. Yeah, and downstream people might not like more releases. You know, it might be you know the right. distros yeah. might not right. like it's just this. You know, there's scales up work everywhere. Right. Yeah. I recall you had this as a question on the the, the annual survey once. What uh, people wanted as a release cycle, and as I recall, this you know forty days or something was sort of the average what people were looking at. I think. So I, I, I don't. I doubt there's much appetite for a, a much different than what we're already doing. <laughs> yeah, and asking users. Uh, I mean, users probably mostly wanted to work, right? 
we don't care about when it's released as long as it works and has <laughs> so. when you when you use curl are you usually download just uh, the final archive and then you build it for yourself maybe you could automate it that this archive is automatically built by one of the CI jobs every day so we could just say we take the current state of the repository and can download it and then try our our build code back. Right, but that we do that also yeah. already. Okay. So because um, but that's just run then people just run the regular test suite with it. Yeah. And that's not what finds problem because we run the regular test suite already on everything on a daily basis or even more. So okay. the, the the challenge is that uh, the reason people find problems with releases is that they run things that we don't test or on platforms that we don't test. Yeah. You know, those things that we really didn't think about. We should have thought about them, but we didn't. And of course, <coughs> we then we add a new test and the next time we won't have the same problem, but we get another problem <laughs> and then another problem and then another problem. Right? I mean, the, the world is full of problems or new ways to do things. 259 command line options in new fun combinations on new platforms with networks that are fun. So it, it really never ends the, the so that the new challenges that might appear. And that's why it doesn't really help that we, I mean, we test everything that we think we should test. Or okay. maybe not. We could always add more tests, but we add more tests already and we keep adding more tests that we think of. Some areas remain tricky. Yeah, some areas are tricky and, and there, and then the, you know, the sort of networks are hard, right? People do fun things and sometimes weird things. So we will keep getting regressions no matter what we try. Do you ever, uh, do you ever get to um, a case where you say, I don't want to add a test for this specific thing because it, it's 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 too obvious or it's so unlikely that we'll get it again. That is too much overhead. I I don't think uh, we have been in that situation. I think possibly. Uh, we what could possibly end up in that situation is, if, for example, if someone wants the test to be very, very slow. You know, if you do a single test case that takes 30 seconds to run, that would be extremely uncomfortable to have in a test suite, right? Because just one test that takes 30 seconds, that would be. So if you would end up in that situation, we would work harder on making something up that could generate the same case in a fact. So usually when, when someone comes up with a test like that. We work harder on isolating the exact thing we want to test and make sure that we can test that in a better way. Maybe just do a unit test for that particular function or fake the times around it so that it executes faster and stuff stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, it's very rare that we actually deny a test case like that. But it's also rare that people just come up with a test case and say, hey, we wrote this yeah. awesome test case. Just like <laughs> That's a that's a gem that rarely happens. <laughs> so number of releases, I think there's a minor sort of change in, in angle over here because we did more releases, because we did more follow-up releases, because we do take regressions slightly more serious now, so we are more likely to do patch releases, even if it's barely visible. So this is an, uh, this is a, a single dot for every release since HTTP get uh, 0 0.1 in November 96. So that's 258 or something, 59 maybe. Have you basically had the same release cycle since the very start? <laughs> Looking at this, you could almost think so. But if you look at the beginning, it's much steeper. Yeah. So in the from the beginning, we did many more releases, and, and uh, <coughs> it's also visible here releases per year. So right. in the in the beginning we did a lot of releases. There are <coughs> twenty one releases in in two ninety whatever. So but uh, so yes, basically since two thousand two something we've been on a pretty steady release number of releases, somewhere around <laughs> six, seven. Last year again we bumped it a little bit because we did more patch releases. Mm. So maybe we have uh, increased the rate a little bit. We'll see if that sustains this, this year. That might be in part due to you know CVEs being fixed, uh, and you know the the pressure for release 
uh, not necessarily about a new feature, but it's about, you know, let's make this more secure. R yeah, but uh, um, I don't think any of the, w we have not done a uh, patch release due to a security problem uh, many times. It's basic, I think we did it, maybe we did it once last year. Mm. and it and before that, I don't, can't even remember when we did it the last time. So I, th I think that's rare. Uh, also because we don't have a lot of uh, high security uh, severity problems. Mm -hmm. So yeah, mostly yeah, these are mostly these are just plain stupid regressions. You know, stupid bugs. So things we did in the previous release suddenly doesn't work in the new release, and you know people are shouting and yeah, mm -hmm. painful. And also, uh, because if we wait to time with fixing regressions, we end up with this weird situation that every release has a set of <laughs> regressions that the previous one, so that you never really end up with a release that where everything works as it's supposed to work. So it's, that's also why it's good to fix the regressions in a patch release and then hopefully end up in a, in a new release that doesn't have any annoying I, uh, I assume that most CVs also happen in the back ends more than in curl itself. Um, like no, I think I no, I think most of them are exploitable with the, with curl too okay. as well. I actually um, in the documentation I always sort of separate if it's a tool or library only, but most of them are in available both okay. or reachable. Mm. M it's more like they often depend on particular features, sometimes particular backends or particular protocol details that okay. maybe not all uh, most users will use, but you know, that's pretty much for every CD. You have okay. to be in a particular condition. Is, uh, is, the, is the release process set up such that it's, it's easy to have a point release where you can cherry pick certain commits or you have to go with master? Uh, I've always gone with master just out of convenience and sort of ease, not because it couldn't do it any other way. So I so I rather stick with it just because it's the, an, an established practice and sort of routine that we have. But sure, you, I mean, there's always the possibility to do other things or create branches and do stuff, stuff in, in, in new ways. I thought there was one or two point releases that did get done on a branch. Yeah, we've so done exactly. There has been some, some of that, but I try to avoid it si simply because we don't have the procedures set up for it. We don't have the tests. We, I mean, we test everything on the master. We do everything like that. So it's yeah. certainly going beyond that is so I think only increases the risk that we do something wrong, right, or misses stuff, miss out on stuff. <coughs> so open. Um, open the um, pull requests, open issues per month, opened or created uh, per month over the last, uh, well, in 2015 we switched to doing development sort of the GitHub way. That's why I start this graph of 2015 because before that it was, we basically did everything on the mailing list. So yeah, number of PRs is uh, gradually growing per month. So. And I think it's funny that the, the blue one here is it differs quite a lot month to month. But again, I guess that's a little bit because they're arbitrary. What's a month and what, what happens in one month, what doesn't happen in the next. So the average is still sort of slow growing. And um, I think also the, the reason why we have so many PRs and fewer issues that we do a lot of PRs without doing an issue about it. So a lot of PRs are bug fixes immediately without filing an issue for it. Do, um, do you think there is any sort of pattern uh, if you were to overlay the release dates on this? Yeah, um, that, that's, that might be true. So maybe we'll s we'll see, or maybe not. I mean, uh, we, we try to, not since we have this weird uh, feature period, so yeah. I would say that maybe the few days leading to a release, I would, hope that we typically at least don't merge a lot of stuff, but I'm not sure it actually is a visible difference in number of issues or pull requests being created. But sure, it could be interesting to have that as a comparison. Um, 
so when when issues are closed uh, and in the in this case it actually checks uh, in this case issues are everything including pull requests so so um, then I've, I've just uh, have a script that just checks how old it is when it gets closed and just fun that median median is there uh, very we basically close uh, more than half within a day uh, and of course the, the green one here is averaged its months which means that basically a few months when I clean up very old ones then the average would go uh, up much because it could be an issue that's been there for a year or whatever so it's sort of a unfair to have that <coughs> that's why I think maybe median m is still the interesting one because that's half of them <coughs> number of issues and pull requests that we have had open during a day yeah. it's, it's also it's we have I, I'm a fan of not having too many open ones lingering around that's why we also move a lot of open bugs to the known bugs document and close it so that's why it's why we maintain this so not every bug is actually fixed just because we close it a lot of them are just documented as known bugs and then close it anyway so that the this is basically the size of the queue of issues and pull requests. I think I think that's a great idea. I think you know part of the problem with a lot of projects is they just keep on adding. And you know, if you're at three thousand issues that are open, it's overwhelming. Yeah, it's overwhelming for yeah. everyone. It uh, it actually never. I've never been in a project where it actually helps. Mm -hmm. And and p part of the problem is that. Uh, depending on your bug tracker as well, you want a view that somehow is relevant mm -hmm. to you when you go there. And GitHub is not very good at yeah, yeah. having th your particular dedicated personal view only catered for you and your issues. So you basically end up with seeing all of them mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. very easily. And when all of them grows above a certain threshold, they become just a busload of mm -hmm. stuff. So, uh, Possibly also a little bit dishonest to the people who have, who have created the issues that mm -hmm. it just lingers around there mm -hmm. for a very very long time. Mm -hmm. Now we actually make it more uh, visible. Oh, it's a known bug. We documented. You can't expect it to get fixed anytime soon because it's just there, documented mm -hmm. known bug. And if it if it's important enough, it'll get on the list. I'm sure. Exactly. Yeah, and I mean everyone is always welcome to work on the bug and mm -hmm. fix it. Right. So it's not that we're keeping people away from fixing bugs. And uh, I think it works for us at least. I don't, I don't mean to judge anyone else's, but this is just how, how it works for us. And, and uh, this is the script that checks when we close issues with git keywords, so the commit messages, the age of the issue that we close. So uh, mean, I'm not sure exactly what it says. Uh, uh, it says that when we act on stuff, we act on them pretty swiftly. It's a little bit of a lie since um, I just told you that we also move things out and says it's a known bug and they of course are not included in this graph. So do you have a graph <laughs> for known bugs? <laughs> known bugs I do need? I do have another graph with a <laughs> number of known bugs. Yeah, excellent. But I'm not sure I have it included here. <laughs> and I, this is just to show then that the corresponding number of emails on the mailing list are gradually <coughs> decaying over time. This is not a surprise and it's not a new development as you can see. Uh, we switched to the GitHub way of developing stuff in 2015. That's sort of there and ever since then, or even before that, I would say that the number of emails on the curl library list, it has been shrinking <coughs> and the number of this, um, emails on the curl users list, maybe not shrinking as much, but it was slow already from the beginning. So uh, we're certainly much more GitHub E these days. I should probably add a graph soon on the GitHub discussions forum, which is sort of taking over more as mm. a discussion place for people. Because modern people, the youngsters, they're scared of email, they don't want to do everything on the web. So they use GitHub discussions instead. So I'm, I'm actually, in, in previous sort of my presentations about Curl, I've had talked about security, but I've moved that to a separate uh, thing. I don't remember if uh, that's today or tomorrow. <coughs> we have this annual user survey and uh, we haven't had it this year yet. Um, 
if you have good ideas of what to ask, we could talk about that. I basically, when I when I do the te uh, the survey, I basically just load the previous one, copy it to new, and go with roughly the same questions, mostly to be able to compare with previous years, so we can see if there's uh, there are any trends. <laughs> it's really, really, really <coughs> difficult to detect any trends or to analyze the results in any way. It just looks basically the same year after year. So I um, and and. Um, what always amuses me is when, since I ask in the annual survey, did you fill in the answer? Did you answer this survey last year? And basically, every year about 15, 20% say they answered last year. So basically, you know, 80% are new this year. And yet, the results are almost identical as the previous <laughs> years. So I don't know. Maybe they're so they're, they don't remember, they're, uh, or people are just roughly thinking the same using the same things, the same protocols, the same features, roughly. There are trends, of course, so some, some things can be detected, like H2 and H3 slowly getting more used over, over the years and so on. But it's still, a it's still basically the only way we have to actually ask users and figure out what users are using, doing, want, don't want. But difficult. I'm going to do that soon. So we tr since it's also sort of a point to have it roughly at the same time of year every year. So we usually do it sometime mid May. <coughs> so if you have ideas, questions, um, let me know and I can share the poll data with you or the questionnaire. So um, other numbers, and, and here it's talking about numbers that are hard to understand. So we are hosted the website, curl.se, and even my personal website actually, they are hosted by Fastly, so we're on their uh, CDN. Um, we celebrated seven years just a few days ago, and we have a 99.95% cash coverage, uh, which is, I think, pretty cool. So 0.05% of the traffic comes to the origin server, um, and that's because uh, an incredible 454 terabytes over the last 12 months. And because this is done by Fastly, uh, well, I indirectly because of that, we, we don't have any logs really. We have, have a very rough idea of what people are actually downloading. So I don't have logs. I can't tell you what people are actually doing with these 454 terabytes. But 454 terabytes up 27% from the previous period. and. Um, that's right, 1.4 terabyte per day. It's a lot of data for a website with very small <laughs> data <laughs> packages. And <laughs> I mean, the images are small, the even the downloads are small. Uh, the biggest one is what six megabytes, I think, the biggest terrible. So it's, uh, it's uh, hard to s see exactly what people are doing. 720 million requests per day on average. I know that for, for a long time we had <coughs> a lot of people downloading the um, CA, the, the um, CA search bundle in pen format. And we had a lot of problems with some Chinese gaming things that were downloading it at a very, very high rate uh, automatically. So maybe th it th stuff like that, that they're still visible. Do you know if those are all 200s or if, uh, is there? They're not all 200s. They're mostly, but they're 200s and 300s, most of them. So they're not that many, because I, I get that separate, separated out on, on the Fastly sort of page. Yeah. But yeah, it's, a, it's an insane traffic. Um, hard to say why. And setting up a logging for that is also complicated because it's you know, it's a CDN network. There are many point of presences everywhere, so you have to have get all the logs sent to a single place. And sure, there are commercial services for that. I tried that out uh, for a short while for one of these free ones, but then it added a lot of complexity because they are super complicated too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I guess you have to be more of a web person to, to be into that. So mm, I don't know. So far, no logs, but also then no tracking, no cookies, nothing. We don't have anything. Right, so very little stats. I can count the number <laughs> of the data. 
people are getting. Um, I I can also say see that I, I would I mean there's a big likeliness that a lot of the traffic is automated in ways because we can see that HTTP one uh, share is very very high mm. and if browsers would do it it would be much more H two and H three so just bec because oh, of that we can the request package or curl. You, you or whatever, <laughs> whatever you're using, but a lot of it is probably automated. Mm -hmm. uh, and f yeah, Fastly then helps us really well because it really takes off the load. Before Fastly, we had occasional problems with uh, stability because it's really hard when people are suddenly downloading a lot of stuff. Before Fastly, even the site tend to you know, go down even just when I blog the blog post that people don't look at. So, mm. uh, not so much anymore. Google Trends. It's uh, interesting just to see how the number of Google search terms used for curl versus two other projects is weird because they seem to be stable. It doesn't seem to change at all. I don't know why. It's impossible to know. It's just weird. On GitHub, we have uh, 34,000 stars. Doesn't say anything. Uh, sorry, uh, the curl that Google Trends. How do you how do you um, remove the trend of hair products? Uh, that's a good question. But Google say they do. Oh, this right. is curl software. Okay. Uh, I have no idea how. The, if I mean, there of course the potential that they don't, and that's w that's why it's up there because that's curl hair products, and we would put on here. If it, I don't know, uh, magic stuff. Let's not bother about it too much. Right, so 6,000 forks. And, and what's fun, right? 15,000 Git clones per day. Talking about automatic stuff. Six clones every, yeah. uh, or one clone every six seconds. Kubernetes and. I am, I'm sure that most of these people are not contributing code back to us at least. That's an insane rate. Uh, all, and the looking all the CIs are doing clones, aren't they? Right. Okay, sitting up, yeah, but cloning that's, that's in there. Uh, they do, that's right. So, but, so that's but a lot of it. That's a l yeah, but not our, I mean, as you're sure. If, but I, I guess a lot of other CIs too. Yeah. So, yes, that's presumably a, a lot of CIs, yeah, so automated the, stuff. The Debian, yeah, so the Debian, the Debian so farms yeah. will yeah. probably yeah. do that as well. Yeah, you're right. So, that probably just tells us that there's a lot of CIs from yeah. curl stuff. Yeah. To just download constantly the package on the main page. Yeah, yeah, yeah that that's, that's why that's rate is so high too. Yeah, it's more like yeah, this is just what they say. Yeah, so it's it's yeah. actually cloned much more frequently than people are browsing the the curl curl page on GitHub because yeah. I think the browser count is about half of the number of Git clones. <laughs> <laughs> but I guess I just chose that yeah, automated a lot of automation. Uh, so I, I still estimate about 20 billion installations, uh, and I, that's, you know, I just put a finger in the air, and basically it's because it's uh, used in a lot of devices, and sometimes that's why I also s switch to talk about installations, and uh, I often have a little bit of a challenge to how do I actually count installations in mobile devices, because since curl is used in Android, typically all Androids and all iOS devices, that's all pretty much all mobile phones. And it's not being exposed as an API in any of those. So everyone who's using it in their apps are installing it again, right? So um, YouTube, Spotify, Skype, all of those, uh, Instagram, you have another installation, right? So in most mobile phones, five, 10 installations. So that's 20 billion installations. If you count all the mobile phones and have five in each, yeah, that's, more than 20 billion. But then also, of course, in all of these other devices, in Windows, uh, all servers, fun things like the <laughs> kitchen devices, the Sony robot dog, helicopter on Mars, uh, all of these fancy games, right? These um, Fortnite and that uh, player, uh, what's that called? PUBG. I don't remember, PUBG thing. Uh, several hundred millions games. 
as in ba as in vehicles and the, these commuter trains in Germany, I think. Uh, had a fun <laughs> curl error message. Spider-Man? Spider-Man, yeah. It's used in the, game, the game. Mo game movie thing. Oh, yeah. okay. <laughs> and it's used in all the game consoles also. It's used uh, widely in printers. Uh, and all the operating systems, so Chrome. And the, that motorcycle also runs curl. And that <coughs> keyboard over there runs curl. So, and they're basically all modern cars run curl somewhere. S someone asked, uh, does that mean that's my MG. Does that mean my phone has curl installed several times? Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah at <laughs> least one. <laughs> and then yeah. basically a few more times, depend if you have some of those popular apps. And most people have YouTube on their phone. So if you have YouTube, you have two installations. And then just adds more installations for other things. I'm not sure exactly if Instagram still has it. But because, you know, I have this fun story about when I figured out when Instagram <laughs> uses uh, curl. But Recently, when I had someone check, it was not included in the credits screen anymore. So I don't know if they just removed it from the credit screen or removed it from Instagram. Yeah. But yes, in a lot of those, this uh, th this medical thing also runs a curl. Yeah, this is Grand Theft Auto Five. That's sort of when I <laughs> when, my, when my kids suddenly th thought I was cool there for a moment. Because so. <laughs> yeah. it's my name there in the ending sequence, and it's so fun because this is if you haven't seen, it's an old game by now, but the ending sequence, it never ends. So it's, it's over 45 minutes long. And that is in minute 42 and a half. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, no one ever saw that. Well, one person did who emailed me and told me about it. So, and there's a YouTube video which said, could sort of you know, scroll all the way through. There it is. And that's a screenshot from there. Um, Do we have any Android CI jobs? No, we don't. And I, I don't know how to do it. I mean, Android and iOS are uh, are at the, uh, at the top ten of, of operating systems that are used by, by users who say they use curl. So that's certainly well used platforms, but hard to test on. Can you run on BlueStack emulator emulating Android or something? I mean, like you that? can probably do a lot of weird. I mean, yeah. running thing. I'm sure there's. <coughs> I'm sure it's possible. I'm <coughs> more like, yeah, someone has to do the job too. Ah. care about it and make sure that it runs and keeps running and apparently and it's, it's not easy right and apparently no one cares about it enough to actually yeah. <laughs> do that and you also have to know if it's a, it's a relevant configuration that you're doing there if you do some special quirk around to get it something running that says I'm Android is it really relevant for yeah, it's a good a deployment test. on an yeah. Android device yeah. Yeah. right so but sometimes you could imagine that just T building it for the platform could be a good test. Yeah. Or did yeah. you break something terribly bad? Just so it is possible to. But but again, the, the the SDK and all that, but it's a bit complex to set that up. Could imagine. And it's, and at the same time, I tend to also watch sort of look at it more like, well, if the ones who are using it, if they don't care enough to do help us do this, yeah, maybe yeah. it's not important enough for them. So. Uh -huh. So once someone think it's important, I'm sure they will help us test it. Maybe. Yeah, the multiple versions of curl concern me. Because guaranteed one will be less secure than another. And yeah. uh, there'll be some sort of ossification of, you know, it will never get updated. Um, but that's yeah. some sandbox in, in the app that it stores, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but and, and uh, also sort of, yeah, I mean, all of these run curl, but none of them run the same curl. And none of them run a curl done after 2019. <laughs> well, <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm making it up. Uh, but you know, yeah, a yeah, lot see, of them run yeah, old yeah, stuff. Yeah, That's yeah, what yeah, I'm yeah. Mean. I mean. How do we encourage? I looked in my car, which runs which immediately after it was updated, just a few days ago, and it runs a curl from 2019. And it runs an Android thing. So it's sort of, yeah, and it's the same version in my phone which was also updated just days ago that's so a lot. 2019 from software updated days ago so mm. yeah that's five year delay but and you know but uh, sure CVEs maybe but this <coughs> much, uh, talking about different curve version people patch their old versions with backported yeah, yeah. patches and then we don't know what it is well we know what they say it is but we don't know what it contains 
so I, I don't know if it's a big problem or not. It's more of a that's the reality. Well, it's it's kind of a big problem because if you have like this, the, I'm sorry, I don't mean to put the security prism onto all this. If you have an S bomb that says I run curl seven seven, um, but it's patched. It's not reality. Uh, you know, it, it implies we need to do checksums. So we have to check. We have to verify. Yeah. Sir, it is that. Yeah, th that's certainly true. I mean, uh, or, or 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 the other way. If you say you run curl version blah blah blah, is it? I mean, is it the released version seven point mm -hmm. seven? If you patched it, right? Or what is it? But that's that's a question for everyone who's doing a sponsor or trying to mm -hmm. show mm -hmm. what you're mm -hmm. using. In most of these cases, I only find uh, uh, um, the curl copyright statement, right? And that includes a year range. That's why I know they when they use, oh, and uh, that's not necessarily true either, but so sometimes they don't update the copyright statement. So they include an old copyright statement, even though they actually upgraded curl mm -hmm. afterwards. So sometimes it I says 2019, imagine. but it's actually code from well, 2020. You don't inject uh, special white space sequences into the copyright code so you can, uh, <laughs> but <that's> <laughs> <laughs> but si since they don't update that, it doesn't matter. Oh, if they st if fair enough. But some of them, I think, just get the copyright statement from the first import and then right, never right, update right. that again, no, even no, though they no, updated no. code. So it, it ends it up in it. It was hacks, hacks SE back then, that curl.se, right? Or yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yes. And, uh, so, and I like the fact, actually, I still like, I like the fact that it contains my email address, that people keep emailing me about weird questions about that. I mean, because, OK, it gives me grief at times as well, but usually it's just fun because it helps me detect curly new mm -hmm. things, mm -hmm. right? Also mm -hmm. about firm firmware updates with cars and stuff like that. Yeah, and <laughs> whatever. They uh, sort of, oh, I had no idea curl was used in this weird thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so usually it's just fun. It also helps me uh, Google for, for licenses and different products. And is there a link in the license now? So when they click onto it, it'll hit no. some copy of the license in curl? No. no. But but in many cases, there's no way to click it anyway. Oh, right, right, so right. In, in most yeah, of these yeah. things, you, yeah, I mean, in most of these things, it's really hard to find the, li uh, the license in general. In, in, in lots of these cars, like even in my car too, you know, you get a thousands of lines long screen so how do you find anything so mm -hmm. if somebody's parked it for 15 minutes and then suddenly you find it or not it's like <coughs> it's not made for anyone to actually ever see it <laughs> um, so money in the project so we have some um, sponsors and I of course, I can always preface that curl is not a legal entity. We don't actually exist as a curl anywhere. So curl is just a name. Well, it's a domain name, right? But uh, curl.se. Uh, um, and uh, I have some other related curl domains as well. I own them. But otherwise, it's not an entity. So Open Collective holds our money. Uh, that's an American nonprofit. So they hold the money. I'm employed by Wolf SSL, so I do uh, commercial Curl services sort of employed by Wolf SSL. So I and Wolf SSL sell curl support for customers, right? So I have a bunch of customers who pay me to make sure that stuff works for them. But otherwise, um, we have a bunch of sponsors. Uh, Hacks is the origin, that's my company. It's not mine, I actually have a couple of friends, but we're the original owners of the, the origin server and a lot of services. We have paid for through the years. Fastly does the hosting. Team Viewer pays for App Viewer um, service. It actually bumped the service grade a little bit. Kira hosts our DNS. We have a um, what's the term? We have a very high availability DNS setup that Kira has arranged for us. Anyway. <coughs> Pretty cool. Elastic is a gold sponsor. They pay most amount of money on a monthly basis. So nowadays we have a balance of 150k USD. So there's no shortage of money in the project, at least not right now. Uh, the, the top financial people, I, 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 
uh, this is uh, screenshots from, from Open Collective, and they separate it between organizations and individuals, which seems totally arbitrary for because some uh, most of the individuals work for an organization and they just did it as an individual, even though they work for an organization. So I don't know. Uh, it just shows that it's highly sort of distributed. Um, Hacker One is giving, giving money. Hacker One is there, right? And Hacker One has this, you know. Uh, we're riding, we're getting ourselves a minivan case of situation mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. <laughs> we get money every time we do a security problem. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and it's, it, is a, so, you know, the, the, um, the bug bounty actually works so that the internet bug bounty pays our bug bounty, so we don't pay anything. <coughs> but when we determine that there is a security problem, it's a valid one, we we grade it as a severity, low, medium, high, critical, and then the internet bug bounty gives out money to the reporter. 80% to the reporter, 20% to the project. 20% uh, turns out to be $14,000 over the years. So uh, the other than the 80% have gone to the reporters. The 20% these, these, these new bangle business models I don't understand. So. Uh, it, yeah, I, I guess I think the the theory is that that's so that we get some money for for the work of fixing the problem and handling the, the, the stuff around it, and not only sort of rewarding the reporter. I think it's a good good setup, and I th think it's a particularly good that we don't have to pay. Anything. Yeah, that's, that's good. It's a little bit weird that we get more money by having more issues. But <laughs> so one of these is in this room. Is that true? Sorry. One of these people is in this room, right? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. It was, it, another list Christian is on. <laughs> he wants to be on every list. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought I could stop it because we don't need the money. Uh. <laughs> right. Uh, uh, do we need the money? Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll show you today. in a second. Um, so we do have expenses. And uh, uh, first we have the curl.se hosting that started to actually charge the project. Started last year, I think. Um, Has that been a good thing, the change to curl SE? Well, they, uh, I mean, for the particular domain, yeah, I think it's just good because it removes the hacks from the name, just because people think it looks weird. So it looks less weird now. I, hmm. I don't know. I don't know what people think of the domain or the name in general. I mean, I figure a lot of foreigners will think .se is weird, to have, but I don't know. Is there a dot curl? Uh, no, 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 and there's no. not dot Please. rl either, or <laughs> something. <laughs> and I've, and uh, all the other, you know, the popular ones, com or net, have been occupied since sure. 20 years. Even though I think only one of them is actually used. Curl.com is some kind of weird programming language, but they redirect from curl.com to another one, so they don't actually use the dot com one. And the curl.org is an individual, and curl.net is dead. So I don't know. It, I don't think it matters too much. What's good is with curl.se is that it's even shorter than the three yeah, other ones. Yeah. Is there a dot Stockholm? You could curl it is. Stockholm. Th right? There is a dot Stockholm. It's owned by the Stockholm city. I, I think it's for city related mm -hmm. stuff. Yeah. Seems completely waste of money. <laughs> <laughs> And so long too. <laughs> yeah, so we, we do um, reimburse uh, top contributors to come to curl up. So basically, a curl up, and, and this particular curl up is, of course, since I'm actually renting this place, so this curl up is going to be a, a one hour bigger expenses in a long time. I, I do also pay for some merch from, from the fund. So all these stickers are paid for by the project, so you're not robbing me when you're getting stickers. So get more stickers <laughs> if you have friends who want stickers. Uh, I, we have paid for development a little bit. Um, it's a little bit ad hoc. Uh, we're paying Dan and we paid Stefan for uh, curl-related work recently. And I think that's cool because we have the money and we n know good people that can do good stuff. So. It's not enough money to actually hire anyone full time, so I think we can keep on doing it a little bit like this. <coughs> and we can discuss what to do more with the money because, as Christian said, there's there's a lot of money there, and that we.
we have coached with them mm, for years. Or maybe we do. Um, You're going to put it all into Bitcoin, right? To, to, to <laughs> right. Uh, Safe investment. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cryptocurrency is the future. Uh, yeah. <laughs> or is it AI? We should, yeah. we should just invest in AI. Well, I think I saw ads for a white paper that combines both. <laughs> <laughs> just put my savings now. That sounds like <laughs> yeah. we'll have AI in crypto AI. That has to be the, yeah. the way we're going. AI on the coins blockchain. Somehow. Right, and, and uh, other than expenses around the project, so we, we do have the, the hosting, the CDN stuff that's all com covered by Fastly. Uh, I think it could be quite expensive if no one would sponsor that right now, because those 450 terabytes, uh, it's not for free. And we have paid um, services, we have the Anycast DNS stuff from QA, we have the bug bounty, yeah, so that's sort of expenses we, uh, escape by having someone just cover the expenses themselves. We don't see this. They just take the, the charge and, and we just use the services. Uh, pretty convenient, actually. So we try to get a free venue for this. I think we, maybe I was a little bit late on it. M maybe it could have worked better if I had, been s had started a earlier. But you know, there's a lot of stuff to do. Sometimes it just happens. So now we're renting this place and we're, and we're re paying for food and reimbursing travel uh, and expenses. So I think we're, I think we are in the 6,000 USD range for this event. I haven't actually did a close count, so maybe, yeah. and I don't have perfect uh, knowledge of the expense stuff. Uh, so roughly like this. I just want to make sure that we actually actually run the right version of this slide. Hmm. complicated. <coughs> oh, well, that's, uh, that's just... So, uh, we removed a few things. Uh, um, so, we removed the NSS and GSK to TLS libraries over the last year, uh, basically because no one is maintaining them, no one is actually using them anymore uh, in a combination. So I've tried to, GSKit is a sort of debatable if it's used or not. Uh, it's being used by some platforms that are never contributing anything. Maybe they didn't use it. It's a little bit unclear. I've got some loud complaints from people at IBM, uh, but not much more than that afterwards. So I figured if someone actually wanted there, they could step up and do something, refresh it, modernize it, and make sure that it actually works correctly. But nobody has. And, and um, maybe until I'm underscore WB was in the same situation. We broke it accidentally a while ago. Not a single soul complained after until a few months later, I think, someone figured it out. And I think they mostly figured it out by mistake because uh, 
they figured out that we didn't set the feature flag that we had the feature enabled. So they noticed, oh, there's a difference here in my previous build compared to this build. Hmm. Uh, they didn't actually use it. So it was a good way to figure out again that maybe we can remove stuff that no one is using. And it was sort of broken anyway. So we removed it. And this is support for the MTLM protocol using the win bind executable which is a horrible way to do it in a library. It was always awful um, and used fork, uh, ugly. Now it's not used anymore. We have a lot of things experimental and we have a m more things experimental now. So we, have we graduated uh, the HP3 support with NGTCP2 as the only one out of four options which is cool. We have added ECH as a new experimental feature. Uh, that is, uh, given the, the look of things, I would th guess that it's going to be experimental for a while. Uh, uh, since it's basically, it works with two TLS, uh, the TLS libraries, it works with a third that is patched and uh, nothing else. And it, it adds a new fun, quick situation to the TLS mix up. So there's a lot of different moving parts. <coughs> and then we have a lot of uh, things left as experimental, uh, Hyper, Russell's WebSocket, and, uh, and the other is three. Is I IPFS? Sorry? Is, I, is the internet about the IPFS? The IPFS is not experimental. Oh, right. It's so in it's there. Uh, but the IPFS is just the gateway. So, right, so right, it's right, basically right. just the URL rewrite. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's more of a lie to call it IPFS, but sort of that's it's done so that you can use an IPFS URL and it works if you have an IPFS gateway. It's an opinionated usage of HTTP. Yeah, it's a, it's, it lets you at least use IPFS URLs. I guess that's convenient for mm -hmm. two users <laughs> or three. You? Do you have HTTP3 via OpenSSL as a new experiment? Or just under other. That's things. included in the other. So okay. uh, so since the only H three that's not experimental is with NGTCP two. So there are three experimental packets: OpenSSL, Kish, Kish, and uh, the MSH. Exactly, MS Quick. Um, and usage on WebSocket. Any feedback? No. Yeah, uh, that's a good question. I I, um, I have that for my future. Let's save that for the future because uh, that's a good topic. Uh, the documentation stuff, we uh, I sort of I call it curl down, but it's more, more almost markdown, right? Because it's, since it's almost, I didn't call it markdown, but it's we're using dot md extension, so it's so it's more markdown everywhere in curl documentation, which I think has already proven good because I think people are more keen on, on, and on actually contributing to the documentation now. It's easy to read and easier to edit and everything. So I think it's good. It was a massive commit there. Uh, took me a while to fix that. Um, and another good part of, of switching to Markdown is everything is now also spell checked and prose linted. So it's uh, the English is also better, <coughs> much better in some ways. Prose lint is the tool mostly spanks you to say very. <laughs> <laughs> Never say very. And don't <laughs> use exclamation marks. <laughs> <laughs> that's the that's lesson. And some other weird stuff. Sometimes annoying because it's, uh, when it finds false positives, it's annoying to hush up. Anyway, I think it's, I think uh, since we have that in the CI, I think it's also improved the language in the documentation. Um, and I also rewrote all the the documentation into present tense instead of future tense, which I also think it's actually easier to read English. It also makes more sense. <coughs> um, so we had, oh, we had a, so since we didn't have the uh, curl up last year, I just wanted to sort of cram in that first we had the, well, in the other order. So the, the last audit was this H3 audit they did on the NGTCP2 and NGHTP3 components that uh, Trader Bits did. And since they basically just audited curl parts that, uh, is that are using um, external libraries, 
I don't know exactly what they what it did. <laughs> well, it was at least limited out of the entire chunk of code that it actually executes when you do H3, but pretty much their conclusion was that it looked pretty good. That's my my translation of of it. I, I think maybe the the best highlight is that they sort of they gave us uh, a real thumbs up for <coughs> the memory management part of, of curl. So that was good. I think the I think the primary complaints were um, maybe lack of fussing and some testing when it comes to H3. They also did another more in depth audit of curl last year, right? Or or the year, yeah, uh, uh, late 2022 actually. They I think we got a report early 23, <coughs> which also didn't really reveal any alarming things. They found some issues, and again. They want us to improve fuzzing and some other stuff. And basically, we all know that. And I mentioned it. We all know that we should increase testing and do better fuzzing. There are new, no news here. Basically, they confirmed that. We also established the sort of a core team. So this year, so uh, basically just we have a way to discuss curl matters. In, and that was just made, made it the term. Uh, I moved the the generation this so I'm, I moved the ownership of the contents into the curl organization on GitHub and I changed the hosting of it so that we now have self hosted um, and so we changed the entire infrastructure around it it was actually kind of cool because it worked pretty nicely without everything breaking apart just a, a challenge to get all the most of the links to work and it worked with some fancy Apache config file hacking. So I'm pretty mm -hmm. happy with that. And now it's much better than we host it ourselves. It's then fronted by, C by Fastly as well. The only challenge with that is that it's give, it offers some interesting uh, caching challenges. So how, how long is the CDN supposed <laughs> to cache it when you update the contents and stuff like that? And then you want to automate flushing parts of it when, when you update parts of the book. Or now it's, uh, I think I set it to one hour cache on, on the CDNs and it, it works pretty good. <coughs> right, and if you have any, uh, it, there are a few open issues, there are contents that we still don't include in the book, but the book is actually pretty complete in that it covers most of everything Curl can do. At 110,000 words, that's 500 pages when you make a PDF out of it, 540 or something. It's uh, it's a lot of content. Uh, right, that's the that's my graph. A number of <laughs> words in the book over the years. So we started. I started that in 2015. So now uh, we started this uh, distros mailing list after uh, a little meeting with uh, uh, distros people in a while ago in March. Um, so in an attempt to coordinate better, especially coordinate back ports and regressions that uh, distros find and fix and work on. I don't know how it works. We have at least used it a little bit. It seems to at least help a little bit. Would you say someone? Yeah, yeah. It's still still very early. There's not a lot of move moves going right. on. So like, yeah. It's too early to say if it's actually it is, yeah. as much. But it's an attempt and we'll see how it works. <coughs> mm, right, and we became a CNA, so we handle our own CVs. Uh, became that in January. Uh, so now we can get a, uh, maybe fewer crap CVs. I will talk about security separately, but so now we're part of this USS open source CNA users group as well. And I'll talk about that later. Uh, we introduced, since we this is 12 month period, I created TrueRel then uh, about a year ago as a separate tool for just parsing and uh, manipulating URLs on the command line. Uh, I think um, one of the primary reasons, of course, being that uh, mixing URL parsers is really bad. So if you want to parse URLs, you better use the same parser. So if you want to use curl anyway, why not use curl's URL parser, especially when you shell script stuff. And, you, and parsing URLs is really complicated in shell scripts in general. Regex them or whatever, it always turns out wrong and bad. And, and you, you forget stuff and you 
silly stuff that you regret later. I'll talk about Turo separately as well. <coughs> so let's go then. It's basically the same let's go that stuff that we always have. Um, so the, the flaky CIs, we have a few CI jobs that basically always turn red, which is highly annoying. So we n we I think every what, every what, 20, 30 <coughs> PR gets a green check mark. Everyone else gets a red cross. And they're mostly just two at player jobs or something that's red and annoying as heck. And uh, we have, as I mentioned before, some of them are slow, which is also annoying. We do uh, have vulnerabilities. I, I'll mention that more in, in my security thing, so let's not talk about that too much. We do have regressions. Uh, we do have test gaps. Uh, in, uh, some of the protocols are <coughs> tested really s badly, I would say. And of course, we could have more people that stick around. Basically, the same things. We could always improve. So there's a lot of room for improvement. I don't think any of this is sort of in a really bad situation, but I think these are things that certainly can improve in the project. And uh, I, I think I'm a little bit wrong here, but I, I, I sort of remain do what I do. So I try to keep things around in the project, uh, inform, renew, merge, uh, talk about curl. And that's, that's basically what I do. Um, and as I said, I'm the only one who actually is just paid to do curl full time. And I do curl full time. Uh, and a little bit more than full time. I spend maybe 50 hours a week on curl. So, and I try to also <coughs> emphasize that I'm not curl, and the uh, curl is not me. I'm a separate entity. I work for Wolf SSL, and uh, sort of I do curl for fun, and I do curl for business. So that that's sort of the overlap stuff. So I try to keep things separate. That's also why <laughs> I, I try to so always keep that to make sure that people know that I keep things separate. Um, in every aspect, so that curl is project that's not me, that's not mine project. I'm part of the curl project, as you all are. So that, um, it's not me. <coughs> and I'm I'm uh, I'm still trying to be to be uh, to be the benevolent dictator, even if I actually think that I sometimes can have a veto right and sort of and uh, deny things, even if I try to not deny or use any sort of dictator role. I often feel that I'm sort of just left to do some things on my own because you all trust me enough to do that and I'm fine with that, but I just want you to know that I try to listen in and have a conversation and not make stuff up on my own in a way no one else wants. Uh, and I think it works pretty well, even though, sure, dictatorship is not a way to <laughs> organize anything really. But yeah, I think it works decently, at least from my point of view, as the dictator here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, which we dictator we would never disagree. say that? Or yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, so, okay, just quickly about the future. We don't know what the future, but I think there's going to be a lot more curl going forward uh, because everything is going to be more networked moving forward. Whatever, everything these days are getting powered and networked, and, and not because uh, there's a good reason for it, but just because it seems to be more fancy and you can sell more stuff and everyone wants to sell more stuff. So there's going to be more networks and more internet and more curl. That's sort of my prediction. It's been for a long while, and I think it still goes. So basically, more stuff over time in with curl and in curl. That's uh, what I think. So, and of course, um, just a question for the lunch break. Is it sustainable? It's very popular to talk about sustainable open source these days. And uh, we're not done yet. And uh, we have a few more years to go. I think we are. My, that's a, sort of my old question from my wife from the past. Sort of, what, is it ever done? <laughs> are you still <laughs> working on that? Uh, that's what I wanted to say. Thank you. Lunch. I, I've got two questions from Twitch. Yes. Um, so one of them I'm going to merge. I'm going to, it's uh, it's from the same person. I'm going to merge those two together. So that's from Embaldur. They asked, um, so is there a way or ideas to motivate, not force, users to update to more current official releases? And then the other one is, 
Can a positive security audit be a kind of a motivation to update smart current releases? Uh, I, I, the, the hard part about motivating people to upgrade is that most people are victims of their surroundings anyway. They use the curl that someone is providing for them. Like a Linux distro or, or Mac or Windows or whatever, and it's not likely that the ordinary user is going to go out of their way to get curl from some other channel. And it's possibly even riskier for them to get it some other channel than just stick to what what they have. So I think it's really hard for, for an ordinary user. We can't expect them to just upgrade to something new unless uh, we distro they're using. You, we can possibly encourage them to not use CentOS uh, version 6 from 1993. <laughs> but but the, or everyone who's using those outdated distros, they are already aware that they're using outdated distros. It's rarely even there. I mean, we get this, it's CentOS 7, right? They use curl 7.29. And that's, I think it's, yeah, it's over 10 years old. And we get frequent bug reports of that one. And it can't be a surprise to users that they're using something that is very, very, very old. Yeah, how do you make those users upgrade? Usually they are there for a reason. Uh, uh, yeah, I would add that um, you know they can always run the, the curl container uh, to get the latest, freshest, most secure. And that was probably one of the, the biggest motivating examples of doing the container. Yeah, I, so, but, but yeah, so if you have a limited or controlled you probably use can't case, run you can, you can, you can run six, a so container <laughs> with it. But at the same time, you if you're a user just running curl on the command line in a Windows script, do you really expect them to run it in a container? Yeah, that's a bit seems dumb. like I, I wouldn't. Ex so I wouldn't do that unless it, there is a really, really strong reason for you to go, because it's complicated. It, it's out of the ordinary. So I understand why people get stuck in what they're given. They, they said. Um, I didn't mean end users, more like distro maintainers and so. Uh, well, I so then I assume they're talking about having distributions to package the newer releases. Right, but and it's a whole okay. different now. Right, but then we, I, then I don't think we can do much yeah. to encourage distros to upgrade because distros are typically they go with the latest <laughs> at some point, and they get stuck with that in their particular branches, and. I don't think we can do much to just sort of strong arm this to so oh, you need to upgrade this version into this version mm -hmm. because they have concepts, policies and things. So they all distros get sort of in version in this particular branch, they have this curl version and they will only do security up patches for that for the next years to yeah. come. And I don't think we can do much to usually and to influence and the I think they we we managed to get not too old versions into Windows and Mac OS. I think I think actually Windows and Mac OS, both of them are actually pretty decent. Uh, recently, at least, uh, have they've been pretty good at Mac OS uh, is an upgrading. 4. Yeah, Windows. I, I have no I don't know contact with the, with the Apple persons, but they seem to be pretty much so that they upgrade at least annually. Yeah, and uh, I've talked to the Windows uh, person. He's been at some of our meetings as well, so. And he, they seem to also at least annually now. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. and of, um, for for Linux distros, generally speaking, the versions you get are not that old. As in, we we almost always have a release. I mean, almost every distro has a release roughly every two years. So at most, you're gonna get a two years old release. Yeah, um, exactly. Uh, and then you can bump it to the next one. Maybe you can use a, a pre-release. And in the case of Debian, for example, you can enable the backports repository on stable, and I always push the latest release to that repository. All right, now that's cool. You don't get you don't get the same guarantees from stable because backports we don't we don't make the same promises. But I always fix all of the CVEs on backports, so you can get that. Right. So uh, I I think that's actually the general the biggest problems are those who are stuck with old distros. Yeah. Like people are stuck with old CentOS stuff. The so option is there, right? It is but, but that's great. sort of that's not our decision. It's their decision. Yeah. They, they, in almost all those cases, they have selected to go there because of some reason that is usually not curl related. Usually something else, of course. Yeah. But but it's not. It's hard for us to do anything about that. So I, I don't know. I think sure maybe 
it's it could be some kind of encouragement to say we have audited this version or that version, but I'm not sure that is it. I don't I don't think people stay away from upgrading, or they they care about audits generally. Yeah. I think maybe some will, but most won't. Most will just trust it anyway. I thought I don't think these audited audits actually change much in terms of yeah. people's opinion or thoughts about Perl. So uh, uh, Ben Boulder said, "It seems like Archie Linux is the only only a few of the distros we try to keep up with the latest." I don't think that's true. Sorry, I'm saying on the, yeah. the uh, from the distro side, um, you can use. You can use Debian testing, you can use Stable with back parts, you can use Fedora, Rawhide, Fedora, uh, the Fedora Stable usually get quite a fresh release of, of I Perl. Yeah, I, I, can, I can say from, from my experience having seen distros do it, I mean, I, I always try to ship curl in a sort of distro independent way without sort of being, taking sides for anyone really, even though I of course use one in particular myself, but I try to sort of not influence, uh, just ship curl for everyone. And yeah. typically it varies over time who's who's the best ones. And it typically just depends on who's the uh, person or team working on those particular distros at a particular moment in time. Sometimes there have been that distro that's been, you know, on their toes and they had their latest three minutes after the release. Sometimes there have been another distro that's been the fastest. And there are a lot of distros nowadays that ship a reasonably updated curl very soon, and I don't think it's I don't think it's one distro. And I think if you look at distros over the last ten years, it has certainly not been the same distro that's always had been the sort of best in class when it comes to that. So it comes and goes a little bit. Um, and so the last question is is a simpler one. Is uh, let me just get the right wording here. Where can you get official curls curl stickers? From me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have. I actually I have uh, another little slide about stuff that in, in my future talk. So I, I'm, I'll save that for now. But yeah, that's a question I get sometimes. I sometimes try to work with some people to get that organized to have some formal place to buy them, but it hasn't yeah. materialized. So there's no way to buy or get any official curl swag. If, if by any chance someone is, is going to attend DebConf, uh, look for the curl maintainers for Debian. Uh, I will be there, I'll, have, I'll bring some stickers for Right, uh, so, so typically that's the way we do it. So get stuff from me and someone hands it off. So if anyone feels like they're going to meet people who want stickers, get more from me and hand them out. You can buy a curl coaster. You can buy the PCB coaster, yes. And you you can all <laughs> you can make your own curl stickers too because the logo is there, you can just make them yourself. But that's I understand why people don't. That's all. That's uh, run for food. Yeah. If you uh, stop the recording on there.